Oh, I might steal this chair here. All right, guys. Well, thank you for coming to Hawaii for 1.0. Thanks for making it. Thank you for coming to Hawaii. Yes, I'm excited. Um, so the very first thing is everybody always wants to know, voila, what does it stand for? Thank you, John. Well, and why did I name it voila? Yeah, you can hand that to uh, Dinah. Dinah does that. Um, so voila stands for, because I didn't want voila to be lumped into any other bodywork modality. I didn't want it to be you know, stuck in with like fascial release or anything like that. So I named it voila to keep it kind of open. And as you know, if you ask me, what do I need to take this course? It's open mind, open heart. Right, and that's all you need. We have a retired professor here today. And what, what was it that you taught? Ta 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 agricultural economist. Agricultural economist. <laughs> well, there we go. <laughs> Something I know nothing about. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> awesome. Um, so, voila stands for, do we have any French speakers in here? We have one, right, Lidwin? What does it mean? Here it is. Here it is. Yeah. As you get into the deeper levels, it's there you are. All right. So after you get level two, you get into that a little bit. But it stands for vector of indication. And I'm in LA, so I added uh, LA to it. The hysterical part is I took three years of French in high school, and I absolutely sucked at it, and I, I failed the final. Uh, but yet, here I use a French word. It's a revenge. Yeah, a bit of revenge. There you go. <laughs> so we're sponsored by Core Nutrition. Uh, it's a great nutrition drink. It's like Gatorade, but it's only four grams of sugar in it. Uh, we have some for you guys to try out here. They got this great new box. So you guys will get to try that out. It's got uh, amino acids in there for your muscles to help them recover, but also for your brain to help that recover. So those of you that are doing all four days, it's kind of an experiment to see how much information your brain can handle. Because usually after even just level one, right, John? Yeah. Brain, brain's like, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what you guys sign there with the NDA and all that is is this is my intellectual property. This is not a course that I've taken from somewhere else and repackaged it as my own. This is literally a download that I got after my mom passed away and this is all new information. Um, we'll, we have a slide a little bit later that we'll talk about, about you have to unlearn what you have learned and we'll talk a little bit about why that is and, and why that needs to happen. So, Physio Care Center, that's my clinic in Los Angeles. Um, that's in there just because my sister says I don't talk about myself enough. Uh, it's an injury and pain prevention center. Most of the people that I see are people that have been to everybody else and nothing's worked. And I literally, um, is it your granddaughter? So Chauncey's granddaughter came to see me. She's a swimmer at UCLA, and she couldn't pronate her hand. And she's a swimmer. She's on the swim team at UCLA, and so she was having a hard time. I forgot the name of the streamline. So she had been seeing the therapist at UCLA for four months, and she still could not pronate her hand. It took me 30 minutes of joking around and playing around. I wasn't working on her for the full 30 minutes, you know, getting to know her and whatnot. 30 minutes, I had her perfectly pronated. I said, now what do you want to work on? But it had taken the physical therapist at UCLA four months to get nowhere. And these are the people that I see. I'm like, you got to bring me something more difficult than this. And I, I'm not saying that to Leah, but um, we had a guy challenge me in one of my first seminars that I taught, he's like, if you can fix my friend, we will buy in. I said, well then, you're gonna to have to come up for a demo. And this guy, he comes waddling up, you know, he's a trainer. If you wanna get busy, hook up with a trainer because they'll screw up people faster than anybody. 
and he comes waddling up and he's got no core. I can just push him over with my pinky. And we made a little nose correction and this guy has the cutest laugh in the world. He's gonna kill me for saying this, but he's like, he starts giggling. And I'm like, what's up? He goes, I feel stoned. And he just starts giggling. And we have him walk back to his seat and he walked like a human. And his buddy that sent me the text, he's like, wow, he's seen everybody. He's seen all the top people in the world and you made one simple correction and now he can walk normal. And I, so again, I told him, you gotta bring me something much more hard, much more difficult than this, because this was super easy. I did this in like five minutes. Well, why was he not walking properly? Because his core didn't work. So he had to stabilize any way he could to move. Okay. So, so could you tell what changed that for him? Like what put him into that state of like having no strength in his core? If he's a physical, if he's a personal trainer, he obviously was strong at one point. So what made him? That's what, that's what this seminar is all about. It's about syncing up the diaphragms. And we're going to talk about that here in just a little bit. And if those diaphragms are not in sync with one another, you have no strength. So every person that is an athlete that I have worked on has all gone back and and they've all broken their old records. Um, I don't know about Leah because I don't know if she's swam yet, but I was working with a, a, another high school swimmer and every time she came to see me, she would break her record that she had set the previous time she saw me. The first time she saw me, she took six seconds off of her 100 meter butterfly. Now, if you guys don't understand how much six seconds is in just 100 meters in a, in a pool, that's almost half a length of a pool. Right? It's just ridiculous on how much that is. And everybody thought, oh, well, she's just not a very good swimmer. Well, I'm here to tell you, she just got a scholarship to SMU. So she doesn't suck, right? <laughs> So, how many anatomists we have out there? Big anatomy fans. Anatomy geeks, we like to call ourselves. Dr. John's one. No one else likes to admit it in my class, especially the people who have taken the retakes here. Uh, we have a few people retaking the course. Because I tell you, anatomy doesn't matter. It looks great in posters. Looks fantastic. They're super cool to have on your wall. They mean shit. We have a pastry chef in here today. She didn't know any anatomical names, did you, Chris? So I said, what? Let's call it that, call it that, call it that, call it that. And Chauncey, you'll be able to do that too. You don't have to know these big fancy Latin names. You're gonna go, is that, is that, is that. Okay. John, you can call out all those anatomical names you want. <laughs> I'm all about physiology physiology and biomechanics, how things can work in harmony with each other. That is the key. Getting things to work in harmony with each other. That's how we get along as a society, right? That's actually one of the intangibles of the voila. So I went to Cortland State, which is in upstate New York. It's a big phys ed school where our anatomy teachers wrote the book that we had to study from. And they also taught at Cornell University, which is Ivy League. So that's where like, a lot of the top vets and your doctors have gone to school. They graded us harder than they graded your doctor. <coughs> How scary is that? Scary stuff. So I was a strength coach for Eris, which was a Cirque du Soleil show uh, that was based out of LA. And um, I was just a strength coach there. So if an athlete had pain, I wasn't allowed to see them. They had to see the physical therapist. This is a tough story for me to tell now because unfortunately this guy just, I'm gonna tell the story about just recently passed away. Um, they found he had an enlarged heart and just, they found him in his hotel room. But um, he was, seeing the physical therapist for about a month. He had a sprained ankle. And it's a big deal for him to have a sprained ankle because he does a flip over, over a piano. And obviously he couldn't do that trick. 
And after seeing him with the physical therapist for a while, I'm like, come see me. He's like, yeah, but I can't because I'm in physical therapy. I'm like, come see me. So the physical therapist comes in, does all his exercises and whatnot, and he's done with that, and so he excuses the PT and says, hey, I'm gonna stay in the gym for a little while, and I'm gonna walk on the treadmill. So the PT leaves, and he comes over and he goes, Joel, now what do we do? I spent about five minutes with him, and he did a backflip. And he just looked at me and goes, you're kidding. I'm like, no, that's how easy this was. And he goes, well, I'm ready to perform tonight. Well, he couldn't because they already hit the different leads and the physical therapy didn't release him. But yeah, he was back performing the next night. This is how quickly you're going to be able to get stuff done with your people. It's a lot of fun. So how this all got started was a Q-tip in my ear. So I slightly banged my head one morning, took a shower, and I wasn't thinking anything of the hit to the head. And I went to go clean my ear out and the Q-tip wouldn't even go into the outside part of my ear. I didn't think anything of it. Went in easy in my left ear. I was walking down my stairs and I realized my ankle was just killing me, so I had to hold on to the railing. And I get downstairs. Now, how many people know uh, Greg Cook? No, not Greg Cook. Gary Gray. He does uh, functional movement assessment. Ooh, that's what's called. He's amazing. He's got this whole ankle protocol that you do. So I did that. Didn't work. Didn't work. But Gary said something that was amazing. He's like, unfortunately he wasn't listening to what he says. He said, the body follows the head. So if I change my head position, it's gonna change the position of my ankle. Well, light bulb goes off for me. So I go back upstairs hobbling, and I look in the mirror and I notice my eyes aren't level. I have one lower or one higher than the other, we don't know which. But I just started pushing on my head. I had no idea what I was doing. Picked up a Q-tip and went in my ear easy. I'm like, hmm, okay. Then I went walking downstairs. I got about halfway down the stairs and realized my ankle doesn't hurt. So that's when the light bulb went off. I ended up balancing my head Took care of my ankle. Pretty crazy stuff. So that's what you guys are going to learn this weekend. So with the Voila Method, we're going to teach you how to assess and balance what I'm going to call the keystones of the body. We're going to do this in st static and dynamic movement. Uh, this would be uh, level one is more of the core. Right, this is what we're talking about with the trainer, getting that core activated, getting that core working again. 1.5 will get into more of the extremities, but also more movement. Okay. So what does Voila do? Quickly and efficiently assesses and finds the areas that need improvement. That's the Voila part. So instead of looking around at this giant mess and going, well, I need to work here, I need to work there, and work there. No, we don't do that and voila. We run our entire assessment where we're like, that's where we have to work. And then we rerun the assessment again. So what's difficult is you have to get out of your head and listen to what the body is telling you. And this is the biggest struggle for new chiropractors and new physical therapists. They struggle with this hard because they can't get out of their head, huh, Dr. John? I have a great story that I'm gonna share about Dr. John. So what you need to know is what is a keystone? A keystone is the boss. Well, if you want to get something done, do you go to a worker to get it done or do you go to the boss? Go to the boss, right? So I figured, why don't I start working with all these bosses, which I, I consider the keystones and the point of, uh, uh, point of strength of the structure. So I used to call myself a lazy therapist, now I call myself an efficient therapist. Okay? I get stuff done very fast, and this is the reason why. 
This is the reason why. So the five keystones of the body are the sphenoid, the manubrium and the sternum. So for you anatomists that believe it's just the sternum, I'm going to tell you bullshit. There's two bones to the sternum. There's the manubrium and the sternum. And yes, they act independently of each other. Most people just lump them all together, and that's a huge mistake. And I get into great arguments with anatomists about this. They call this the sternoclavicular joint. That's not the sternoclavicular joint. It's the sternomanubrium joint. They react to each other very differently. We have the sacrum and the coccyx. That's the largest keystone we have in our body. It's also the most uh, stable. The talus and the toes, especially that big toe. We'll get into a little bit more of all these here. So the goal of this structural joint balancing, is what we're going to go over today or tomorrow, is to achieve equilibrium in these cranials and these keystones to make sure they're all working in harmony. Right? So if we have any dancers in here, what's the difference between a dancer dancing to music and, say, me dancing to music? One looks graceful, right? <laughs> and that's not me. <laughs> right? Because they're in harmony, right? That's how the body functions. You get it in harmony, it's beautiful to watch move. Yeah, we get focused on, oh, well, that and that and that's not working, so I need to work on that. And a lot of times, it's not the area that needs to be worked on. So we're going to make you guys more efficient at what you do so you can work less hard. Who does not want to work less hard? Shit, Chauncey's retired. <laughs> so what you guys are going to learn is you're going to learn how to assess and, and uh, balance these structural keystones. You're going to learn how to sync the diaphragms, which is so easy. That confuses a lot of people when I mention that on, online about you must sync the diaphragms. And like, what are you talking about? We'll talk about that more in just a second. We're going to create whole body symmetry. I'm going to repeat that. Whole body symmetry. So if someone comes into me with an ankle issue, how much time am I going to spend on that ankle? Who knows? I just told you an example how I fixed my ankle by correcting my head. Okay. You don't know where it's going to come up. And that's, going to, that's the hard part of what I talk about is you must unlearn what you have learned. This is key. Um, one of the first classes I taught, physical therapist raises their hand. I did, a, I did an assessment, made the correction, and all of a sudden the person raised their arm up. So now the physical therapist, her jaw is open on the ground, and she raises her hand. Joel, this is not in any of my textbooks. I said, I know. Isn't that sad? We had another young chiropractor take the class. I had a, another retired electrical engineer in the class. Could not reach back to his back wallet. Well, I wanted him to take me to lunch, so I needed to make sure he could reach there, right? So he's struggling with this, and it's a lot of pain to do this. So I run the voila assessment. I made a correction to his fourth toe. He reached up into the middle of his back with his hand without pain. And he's just like, wait, 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 wait. You just corrected my toe to fix my shoulder. I go, yeah. The chiropractor said, that's it. And he got pissed off. Why did he get pissed off? because he spent hundreds of thousands of dollars in chiropractic school. He knows he's wanted to be a chiropractor since he was a young kid. And I just showed him how to correct his shoulder in less than a couple of minutes. So he got pissed off that he's spending all this money on chiropractic school. So he doesn't want to learn well up because he feels he needs to struggle in order to get successful. So I'm going to turn this over to Dr. John real quick. And do you have any words of advice or wisdom to that? <laughs> uh, about, about getting out of your head? 
Yeah. Uh, just, and about the struggle. About the struggle. Oh, about the struggle. Yeah. So I've been doing this for 35 years, and I'm I've, uh, I'm a lifelong learner. So I, when when you saw the circles up there, when you, you ask who's anatomist and who's physiologist and who's kinesiologist, yes, I am. All of that. Mm -hmm. I know all of that. I've been to more seminars than probably everybody here combined. And. <clears throat> Um, but I don't practice like that because I've been through all of that frustration and that struggle. That, and it really is. The reason is, is because your patients never read the textbook that you read, so they don't know what you're, they're, you're expecting to see from them. So they come in and they go, well, it hurts when I do this. And I say, oh, then it must be that. And it's not because they don't, they didn't, they're not matching the textbook. So, um, I was also, I've also been involved in martial arts for 40 years, something like that. And, um, yeah, 40 years, yeah. And um, I, I've always watched karate people, they learn what they call kata, they, 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 they sets, these routines, they learn kata. And a monkey can learn kata, basically. Uh, so when I met my nephew in Atlanta, he was a teenager, and he said, oh, I'm a, a black belt in American karate. I said, oh, when did you get your black belt? Oh, when I was 13. I said, 13. <laughs> and he goes, yeah. And I said, well, how many fights have you had? He said, I don't fight. I just do kata. I said, what? And he said, yeah, I just do kata, and I do weapons. He spins swords and sticks. And I said, well, so you're a dancer. Right? You're not a fighter. You're not a martial artist. He goes, no, no, I'm a black belt. Okay, I have, I have stripes on my belt. Said, well, that's not the martial arts I would want. So, <laughs> yeah. but the problem with with kata is the guy that you're fighting doesn't know what kata you know. He knows a different kata. So, you know, you're standing there and you make this beautiful jump and you land on your ass because. The guy didn't follow you. He didn't do what you were supposed to. Do. Exactly. Yeah. So life is like that. You know? And healing is like that. I mean, you know, I've been doing this for a long time, and I've never found a textbook case of anything in 35 years. So take your textbook, throw it away, because all of that, that that's just the rite of passage. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Now in the real world, you got to learn how to think on your feet, and the less you think, the easier it is. So you just got to follow. It. Did you hear? Yeah. Did you hear what he just said? Because that was absolutely key. Take what you think you know and throw it away. Because, like he said, healing does not follow a specific set of rules that you've been taught. It doesn't. The body is dynamic. So you're technique should be dynamic and that's what makes walleye different than any other thing that i have found is it is dynamic it reruns the assessment probably during a session i probably run the assessment 30 to 50 times it never made sense to me to okay dr john comes in i'm going to do an assessment on him okay now i'm going to treat him and i never reassess never made any sense to me. So, how many people do FMS? Perfect. Nobody. But don't teach shit. <laughs> it doesn't. I'm sorry, it doesn't. Who walks upstairs with a broomstick on their back? Nobody. So why is that part of your assessment? Makes no sense. Makes no sense. So, logic will get you from A to B. So if you're client happens to fit into A to B, you've done a wonderful job. But as Dr. John explained, your client doesn't come in A to B very often. If they did, they can go to any therapist. But if you have somebody that's seen everybody and not getting any better, and you know that that person that they've seen has gone from A to B, do you think they're going to do A to B any better than that doctor did? No. So imagination is the key. And that is what Dr. John's talking about with not thinking.
right? You can go back and use logic of why that worked afterward if you are stuck in logic. Keith, you might get a little stuck in that, okay? That's totally fine. I'll explain the logic if you want after I do a correction if you, if you want to have any explanation, okay? Uh, so feel free to raise your hand and say, hey, how did you do that or what happened there? Okay, but we'll explain it to you, okay? But this is the hardest part. And, and the reason everybody wants you to believe this A to B is because they want you to take their seminar and said, I taught you how to heal somebody. It's the biggest ego statement in the world. I'm here to help you not think. I'm not getting you here. I'm not here to help so you follow me. That's not the point of this. The whole point is for you to help others. That's the key. So the body knows how to heal itself. It innately knows how to do it. It is telling you, if you have pain in your shoulder, I'm getting a nice ring in my ear, so I said something, I'm getting a message in. Client comes in with pain in their shoulder, it's a message for that client. So what we like to look at is a gift. That pain is a gift to say, hey, I need help, please help me. That's all it is. It's... That is that client that comes in and their ankle hurts, now their hip hurts, and now the pain has gone to my shoulder, and now my elbow hurts. Well, all of those little hurts have been knocks on the door. So say I got a pain in my ankle, that gift is knocking on the door, you don't pay attention. A few years later, oh, my hip hurts. That's the knocking on the door, hello, are you gonna pay attention to me this time? Oh, you're not going to pay attention to me. Oh, okay, I'm going to make your shoulder hurt. Are you listening? And you still don't listen. And now the shoulder, or that, now that elbow hurts. Now you can't lift up anything, and now you're like, go see a therapist. And they're going to go A to B, and they're not going to help you. <clears throat> they might cover up the pain. They might mask the pain for a day or two. One of the big things I tell people is, I don't give a shit if the client is better on my table. I could care less. Why? Because there's 23 hours of the day that I want them to feel better. Not just on my table. That's an ego thing to be, oh, I showed you how great you are on my table. But now they get up and they walk outside, day and a half later, you're in pain again. That's not good enough. I got tired of seeing the same client week after week, with the same problem. I got bored, right? And, and then we're here to help people, right? How many people can you help if you see someone two to three times a week, every week? You might have 20 patients, period, that you see over and over and over again. Well, 20 is not enough for me. I wanna see thousands. Right? If, if I'm just seeing 20 people, big deal. Yeah, I might have a nice house, but big deal. I'm only helping 20 people. Right? My goal is to help millions. And hopefully that's what you guys are here to help with. Help millions. Right? It's much bigger than us. It's much bigger. So, let's move on. Sinking the diaphragms. We're going to do a demonstration of this later. We're not going to do that now, but the body is a pressure unit. It, uh, I'm trying to come up with a better example, but if someone gets stabbed in the stomach, what do they die of? What? Hemorrhage. Right, so loss of blood, which is what? Loss of blood pressure. Pressure, do you hear it? <laughs> That's what it is. The body now doesn't have enough pressure for the heart to work to pump the blood. It can no longer exist. The body is a pressure unit. So you have to get all these diaphragms working in harmony and all of a sudden strength goes through the roof. 
We have a great example. I have a power lifter in the class. He was stuck at 380 pounds in his bench press. I said, great, what do you want to bench? He goes, well, I'd love to do 400. I'm like, perfect. Brought him up to do a demonstration. Now, I don't have 400 pounds. I have a broomstick. And I say, think of doing 380 pounds. He goes, well, I do 380 pounds with wrist wraps and a belt. I'm like, cool, do 380. Does 380, it looks beautiful. I go, great, now just think, this is how powerful the brain is. Just think that that's, this bar now is 400 pounds. He does it, I run my assessment, I make a correction to his wrist and to his ankle. The ankle was the big one. Well, he's a power lifter. So this was prior to lunch. So at lunch, he runs to the local YMCA without wraps, without his belt, and benches 400 pounds. That's almost like the swimmer increasing six seconds on the butterfly swim. So he did it without the wrist wraps and without the belt. He achieved his goal. 15 minutes after I worked on it. But does that, is that because you changed his physicality, like his physical strength, or is that because the change and the, the balance of the diaphragms changed his mental state so he was able to be in like the state of flow so he was able to attain that both of those things so what we what we talk about is there's a if the diaphragms aren't in harmony with each other there's a leak in the system and that's all pelvic floor issues are there's a leak in the system so people will hold their breath to move well how long can you hold your breath and move all of a sudden now you've got to start getting a wicked headache right so all these things have to work in congruence with each other. And once you do that, and like I said, uh, the talus was one of our keystones, so that's one of our diaphragms. Once that's able to function, now the rest of the diaphragms don't have to work harder to make up for that ankle. Okay? It's, it's, it's a strange concept. But once you see it, yeah, it's yeah, the light bulbs are just going off over your head. It's it's it's, it's awesome. It's a really hard concept for most people uh, to come up with. But once you get it, it's, it's so easy. It's so easy. How many diaphragms? Actually, I have a quick video for you guys to watch, and then we'll talk about the diaphragm stuff. Hopefully, you guys can hear this. Let's get to this. And it's what we work with in voila is the sphenobasilar joint, which is the sphenoid. It's this beautiful butterfly shape we got here. And the occiput. And right where they come together is the sphenobasilar symphysis. And this is what I call the hard valve of the diaphragm system. So as we inhale, it opens. And as we exhale, it closes down. And this is where you get that hard lock. So typically with our athletes that have been hit in the head, this may get stuck open in a, some sort of a torsion. And there'll be a pressure leak. So it'll be like air leaving a hose. On the other end of that spectrum, we have the sacrum and the coccyx. Okay, so what happens here is as we inhale, we get that anterior tilt. This is allowing the pelvic floor to drop. And as we exhale, the coccyx comes in, the pelvic floor can tighten. This is what I call the soft end of the pressure system or the valve. So this is you know, more of a muscular system. So when people are saying that they have a pelvic floor dysfunction or issue, typically the problem is they're either stuck in anterior tilt and they can't posteriorly tilt, or it's the sphenobasilar joint that is stuck open because they can't close it. Makes sense. So just recently I saw a thing, and there's a modality out there that teaches that uh, flip-flops are called toe fuckers. And it creates all sorts of back problems. 
So obviously being here in Hawaii, apparently Hawaii has a really bad back problem and foot problems. What a joke. <laughs> Flip-flops do not cause that. Otherwise we'd have a whole country seeing Jack, Dr. John because I got back pain. <laughs> the problem is people tell you something and you believe it, you don't put it to the test. What I teach you to do is anything I say, put it to the test. Challenge it. That's how I did this. That's how I figured this stuff out. I would go to a seminar like Dr. John, person says something I'm like, hmm, interesting. Let me challenge this and put it to the test. And it would fail. I'm like, okay, that didn't work. It didn't work. And not just do it once, multiple times. Keep doing it. Realize it didn't work. So one of the things, uh, and we'll talk about this uh, later, so how many people, you know, stick their elbow in that big old knot there on that levator scapula, right? And everybody goes to massage therapist and they dig their elbow in there and it feels good. No, it doesn't. <laughs> Day and a half later, that pain's back again. I'm going to tell you the problem is always the clavicle. You make a correction to the clavicle, this big knot goes away. So I challenge you to put that theory to practice. You'll put your hand on that big old knot and you'll make a correction to the clavicle and you'll feel that knot just soften and disappear. So I said that to the class, guy went home and he tried it and he's like, that's impossible because I literally felt that soften up and go away. So next person comes in, they have it. I tried it again and he kept challenging it and it worked every time. So there's no point in beating up your client trying to dig out a knot. It's a waste of time. So here is a woman obviously with scoliosis. This is a before and after picture. This was done by a person that just took the level one class, had no idea what they were doing, and said, can I try something? Anyone want to guess how long this took? Five minutes, everything that we've said. <laughs> we got a smart one here. <laughs> Six breaths. Six breaths. That was breaths. Six of those. That was the change. How do you know how many breaths are needed? You can ask. But typically for this class, we give you three breaths to make the correction, and then you recheck. Most of the time, the correction will happen in three breaths. If it doesn't, there's something else going on. That's the beauty of the vector of indication, is we are working with the body. We're working with, with what the body wants, not what we think it needs. That is key. We are working with what the body wants, not with what we think it needs. If you think you know what it needs, that's ego. Okay? And that's your A to B. It doesn't work very often. Okay? Yeah, it took six breaths. Now, here's another one. This is a personal trainer who has zero body work experience. She takes the class. Her client comes in, her hands like this. The trainer says, I just learned something new. I have no clue what I'm doing. Can I try it? Fortunately, the client said yes. I would have said no, right? But the client said yes. She's able to now wear her ring. She asked the trainer, what did you do? The swelling in my hand is gone. The trainer said, I don't know. All the trainer did, remember we talked about that sphenobasilar joint in that video? All she did was make a move to the sphenobasilar joint. And all that inflammation went away. So people are out there are saying all this stuff about inflammation, inflammation, inflammation. What about the lady with the scoliosis? What about her? What was the correction that was made? It's hard to see in this picture. That's a great question, Whitney. If you look at her head, it's tilted and turned to the right. 
and now her head is balanced on top of her spine. That was what the correction was. I don't know the, all the corrections were made. She needs more work, but she balanced the head on top of the body because that's what she was taught. Have you had um, interesting results about the scoliosis itself on people? One more time, Lewin. Have you had any interesting stories, I guess, about working on people for the scoliosis itself? Or is there something we can do with Wala that can actually help straighten your spine? Uh, is that straighter? Yeah, so it definitely looks straighter, yes. Yeah. But because I've heard so much about ah, scoliosis, you know, you can only like not heal, obviously, but you can only like help the person deal with it on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. My question is, can we get more? Right. So this obviously is a functional scoliosis. Right. Um, does everybody notice that scoliosis usually happens at a certain age? Right. We scan for it in junior high. What happens in junior high? Puberty. Puberty. Yeah. Emotional wreckage. Emotional wreckage. <laughs> yes, with me. <laughs> yes. So. This is just showing level one, what it did with scoliosis. There's obviously much deeper levels. We just talked about this more in level four. Um, I won't give away what we talked about, but another way to help out with scoliosis. People think they know what they're doing in movement, and they have no clue what they're doing in movement. So I love it when people call themselves body movement masters and stuff like that, and they have no clue about movement. Movement is innate in our body. Who taught you how to walk? Yourself. Yeah. Trial and error, right? Someone didn't say, hey, you need to put your right foot forward, now you need to put your left foot forward, but first you need to do. And that's what trainers do. They talk you to death about how to do something. No, you correct it. You let the body function on its own. Dr. John is a perfect example of this. He just told you he was 35, 40 years of martial arts. He was my first demo of the day. What I like to do is pick the most difficult case <laughs> and bring them up and do my demonstration when I, when I show you the voila assessment. And I make the correction. Made the correction and, and I can't remember what it was. Was it your nose? Um, I, th I think it was a phenol basal joint. It was a phenol basal joint, yeah. All of a sudden, Dr. John goes back to his table, and I continue on with teaching. All of a sudden, Dr. John is going into all these split poses and moving to figure out what he could do. I'm like, Dr. John, you feel okay? He goes, my physical therapist has been trying to get me to do these exercises for years, and I couldn't do them. It didn't feel good, did it? And now he's going down in almost split position because he can't. He starts exploring his new body. And that's literally what you're doing. You're giving people their bodies back. That's, it's, it's so fun to watch. It doesn't get old with me. It just does not get old. I can't do push-ups anymore. Yes, you can. I, I literally I just had a client can't do push-ups. And her boyfriend wants her to do 10 push-ups by the end of the year. So I brought her in and made a couple corrections. She did six push-ups. I go, I think we're going to reach her goal by the end of the <laughs> very soon. <laughs> so we'll look in and see why you can't do uh, your push-ups. All right? If not, in the next two days uh, over the weekend. All right? Here's another one. Person came in, so you can see they put the X's on there, so you can see the difference in their eyes and after the session. You can see the difference in their eyes. I don't care what modality you do. John has a great modality he goes out and teaches. It's wonderful. Take the class. But if you don't address the head, you're not going to get anywhere. That's why John's here to take the class. Right? Yeah.
John gets great results. But now he works with the head a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> so I showed you that. Now everybody always wants to know how long this stuff lasts. Well, this is a personal story for me. This is my dad's hands. I happened to be uh, at his place and he said he couldn't open the jar anymore. And the doctor told him he has arthritis. Well, obviously he does. So this is his knuckle. Fortunately, my sister reminded me to take a picture of it, so she took the picture of it. And this is my dad's knuckle. How much longer later, Wendy? <laughs> Three breaths. <laughs> You're correct. Three breaths later. My dad's like, I can feel that moving. So now everybody wants to know, how long does it last? That's four months later. Obviously, he has arthritis here. This hand was actually worse than this one, but I forgot to take a picture of that one. When you have like a broken bone or a scar, there's already a permanent damage, I guess, to the body. So when you do a correction, is there a possibility that at some stage, the fact that the bone or the skin is no longer perfect can have an impact and you may have at some stage to redo a correction? Of course, a direct force trauma is very different. That's really not what we're talking about so much in this class, but direct force trauma. So, you know, I was a football player. So say I take on a, a, a tackler with my shoulder and my, also now I can't lift my shoulder. That's a direct force trauma to my shoulder. You would address that first and then you would go into a, I mean, you still wall off assessment in, but that would be the area you'd go to first to work on. So direct force trauma is different. Scars we talk about in level two, I don't touch scars very often because it's an emotional trauma. I release scars without touching them. I'm not big on talking about other modalities, but one I really can't stand, just to be a totally straight up front and honest with you is that, and I'm not going to use the name, but that metal scraper, worst tool I've ever seen. Worst tool I've ever seen. Is it the fascia scraper thing? Yeah. So in level two, I do a demonstration. I hold that tool up and I ask the client, can I touch you with this? This just happened in the LA class. Broke out in hives just from the look of the tool because they had been worked on by that tool for an ACL tear and some scar tissue in their knee. Just seeing the tools, she broke out in the hives. It's one tool I really don't like. I really don't like. It causes more trauma than it helps. It really does. That's just been my experience with it. Hasn't been good. So let's carry on. Structure dictates function. You'll hear me say this a lot. So gravity is constantly pulling on our structure so it can pull things out of whack, balance, alignment, whatever you want to call it. And when it does that, it interrupts the electricity flow. So electricity is part of the pressure system, right? Without electricity, the pressure system can't work. We want that electrical system to work as quickly and efficiently as possible. How fast is the speed of light? Doc? Very fast. Very fast. <laughs> Says the agricultural economist. <laughs> Did I get that right? Okay, good. 186,000 meters per second. This is why I say there are no muscle patterns, is because if you are looking for a muscle pattern and you're trying to test for a muscle pattern, if the speed of light is 186,000 meters per second, and now we take that around the equator of the Earth, 
you have gone around seven and a half times, which is how long? One week. You're already a week behind. Do you guys see that? Can you, can, can you grasp that concept? If you think you see a pattern, you are already a week behind. And that's if you can think of a second what the correction is. How many people can do that? No one. So you are, now you're months behind to the brain. Because that's how fast things are happening. You gotta understand, we only see a, 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 a sliver of the light that's in the world. Because we can't see it all. We blow our brains up. We can't see it all. Okay. So I worked with Dr. Eric Dalton for a long time with a mild skeletal alignment technique. And I was assistant with him for years and he always talked about this right short leg. Talks about this right short leg and that's going to throw the hips off and it's going to go this way and shoulders are going to go this way, right? So we're going to have a tight QL here or a tight QL here, a weak QL there, right? We're going to have a tight levator scapula there. And these are going through all this process. And every seminar I've gone to, they pretty much talk about this same bullshit. Because I had a client that I've had with me for over 20 years. Three-quarter leg length differential. And it's not, uh, it's not, uh, it's, it's anatomical because it has, it's been measured. He's measured exactly the same. Well, when I look at this chart, Instead of looking here, or looking here, or looking here, I went to the one place no one looked. Look at the head. It's side bent and rotated. So my client that I've been working on, and I feel horrible, but thankfully I didn't charge him full rate, <laughs> for 20 years, trying to get his leg length even. Didn't work. So I said, hey, I had an idea. Something popped into my head, I want to try it with you. He's like, sure, he's been my guinea pig for 20 years. I balanced his head on his shoulders, his leg length went even. I've been trying for 20 years to get his leg length even. I did it in two minutes with this new voila modality that I stumbled on. He went through a windshield of his car years ago, so obviously he had some head trauma. Took care of that, leg length evened up. Or we can keep working on this tight QL and this tight levator scapula, if you want. If you want to keep seeing the client over and over and over again, make them your best friend. Then they hate you because you took all their money. How many people have had someone come in like, I have no money to, t to spend on this therapy because I've seen everybody and I've spent hundreds of thousands of dollars. Dr. John, you've heard that. I hear it all the time. I said, I'm sorry, but you still have to pay me. And they walk out and they're like, they're pissed off that they had spent thousands of dollars trying to get better and in an hour they're, they're done. They're not mad at me. They're mad because they've been all over the place and not gotten any better. One, one, of, one of my favorite stories is I had this woman with, uh, Doc, you have to help me out with the name, but uh, Chiara, is that how it's named? Where the brain, the brain goes down into the hole? Oh, yeah. It's Chiara something, or something Chiari. Oh, yeah. That's a syndrome. Yeah. It's a, yeah. So anyway, what happens is the hole, the base of the head is a little bit bigger than normal and the brain starts falling down into it. And it's very painful. Lots of headaches. Lots and lots of headaches. Uh, so the physical therapist that, that took the course, she sent her mom to see me. And she wouldn't tell her doctors how much pain she was in. 
So she comes to see me, and I and we'll talk about this. this I usually tell the story later, but since we're live, we're telling it now. So I went to go touch her head, and she said, "Whoa, stop!" I go, "Okay, what? She goes, is everything okay?" She goes, "The energy in your hands is too much for me right now." So she goes, "Let me let me tell you something." I'm like, "Okay." And this 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 ties into why um, that intake form you guys take for like clients for your soap notes my favorite word it's bullshit <laughs> they're lying to you because they're only going to tell you what you think they you can help them with it's not the real thing uh so this woman after i go to touch her head she goes okay now i'm going to tell you how much pain i'm in well, why did she tell me how much pain she was in just from feeling my hands go near her head. Because she knew I could help her. Because she knew I could help her. My favorite part of this story is I got to see her two months ago. Hadn't seen her in two years. Totally different looking woman. Happy again. Just full of life again. It, it was so amazing to see her two years later. They live in Montreal, so I've seen her. So does she not have those symptoms anymore? She still has them, but they're less severe. Yeah. yeah. We're, you're never going to yeah. cure killer. You're not. But we can work on getting that pressure system to work so that brain doesn't keep being sucked down in there. Yeah. That's what we can do with that stuff. It's pretty cool. So when you ask me, Lou, when I do have stories, I can, tell, I can sit here and tell stories all day long. <laughs> but we got work to do. So the question is, what are the two most protected areas of the body, Keith? Uh, the rib cage. Rib cage. That's one. Uh, in the brain, yeah. Right? I saw Keith looking ahead in the book. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, the head, I include the spine in there too, very protective areas, right? And so is the sternum and the rib cage, right? So we have our electrical system, the brain, and the heart, lungs, the cardiovascular system. If these are the two most protected areas in the body, as body workers trying to help people in pain, why aren't we working on these areas? It made no sense to me. Right? You work on these two areas, wow. But this is also the reason I don't show videos of what I do online. Because working with these two areas is a lot different than showing how to do a fascial stripping of the forearm. You're working with somebody's brain and their heart. Mm -hmm. if, you, if something goes awry and you don't know what to do, you cause some deep shit. And I don't want to be responsible for that because people are going to look at a video and go, oh, wow, that looks easy. I can do that. And then shit hits the fan and they don't know what to do. Okay? And that's why this class is done in person. And so when shit hits the fan, I can take care of it. Okay? Not this going to. Not this going to. Okay? So for you anatomy geeks, we could stop the seminar now. And we can go over all 650 or so, plus or minus muscles there are in the body. You want to do that, Doc? No? Okay. We can go over all 187 joints. John almost put his hand up for that one. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to cover a lot of these, but I broke it down into five keystones. The human skull out. is made so up now of we're gonna watch this video. bones that surround and protect the brain and 14 facial bones that form the underlying structure of the face and support for the teeth. With the exception of the mandible, the bones of the skull articulate with each other through joints known as sutures. Throughout the skull, holes known as foramina serve as passageways for blood vessels and nerves. Bones on the surface of the skull encase the brain, protect sensory organs, and serve as attachment sites for the muscles of the Oops, sorry about that. For some reason, the uh, 
for some reason the video is not part of it, it's not playing. All right, well, well, we'll be talking about this a lot, but what this is basically saying, this video, is the sphenoid is affected by all the bones in the head. And conversely, the sphenoid affects all the other bones in the head. That's why it's the keystone. Okay? Um, this video is up in the file section, so when you get added to that uh, tonight, you'll be able to watch this video. So I apologize that uh, for some reason didn't work here, but that's okay. So this sphenoid, here she is, or he. How we are going to act, what'd you say? So Isn't it? It's called the butterfly. And it really does. It does look like a butterfly. And how we're going to access it is right here in the temple. That's how we're going to access and be able to move it, balance it. So since Dr. John was a martial artist for many years, do you still do it? No. Not anymore. Okay. Um, he'll tell you this is the spot you're trying to hit the person. Either here or here. here. Trying to hit them here. Why? Not yeah. And the lights go out. Also, you ever see somebody get hit in the head now? <laughs> yeah, boxing is brutal and all that martial arts is brutal, isn't it? Um, you, you, if you've seen any martial arts or uh, boxing and they get hit in the right spot they fall on the button and all of a sudden they just drop straight down. Like they're, they have no function over their legs, they have no function over their arms. It just lights her out. And it's from getting this jostled so hard, it's the body's defense mechanism shut down. I'm in deep trouble, shut down. Okay, and that's what happens. So, as far as anatomy, I like to look at things very differently. So, obviously, this is where we're going to be able to touch it. That's the, called the greater wing. So we have the optic foramen, that's where your uh, optic nerve goes back in, you have your supraorbital fissure. So what's that telling you, what sits right here? Your eyeballs. Yes. That's why eyes are so important. And we'll talk about that later. Uh, the one rule with voila is we never stick a Q-tip in somebody's eye. If you do, you're out of the group immediately. Okay. I know you're, you're going, but who would do that? There's a modality that teaches that. Uh, this here, what are these? Your sinuses. So you have someone comes in with allergy problems. I used to suffer from allergies big time, two times a year, May and November. It's a big parts in LA for some reason. We get the Santa Ana winds kicked up. Ever since, I hardly have any allergy problems. I don't take allergy medication at all anymore, and I used to have to take that heavy-duty prescription stuff. I don't take it at all anymore. Ever since, I've been able to balance my head. Lateral pterygoid plate, what attaches to that? The lateral pterygoid. <laughs> Trick question, wasn't it? Yes, the lateral pterygoid, which also attaches to what? Correct, when you say it? Okay. Your mandible, your jaw. So everyone's like, oh, it's a jaw issue, it's a jaw issue. Well, the jaw is a floating bone. Is it gonna affect the full structure? Very rarely, very rarely. I was in a, a class where they went into the mouth and they released the lateral pterygoid for this person's jaw pain. And this is again why I say I don't give a shit if they're better on my table, because they showed Doing it on the table, they released that lateral pterygoid. She got off the table and she walked to the back of the room. She happened to be my partner and she was in tears. Taking those steps to get to the back of the table caused her so much pain because they released her lateral pterygoid. Okay? This is why I don't release muscles. They're so low on the totem pole, sorry. 
<laughs> because they're so low on, on the totem pole. So when I look at here, like I said, I see things a little bit differently. What does that look like to you guys? It's a, something that people have quite commonly, and I haven't seen any in here yet. But not everybody has their shoes off. A bunion. A bunion. So one of the things we talk about tomorrow is the body follows the head. Or people say the body follows the eyes. The reality is the body follows the sphenoid. If your sphenoid on the horizontal plane is twisted, you are going to walk in that direction. So what's going to happen is you're not going to push off that big toe in a straight line. You're going to push off into the straight line of the sphenoid. So now I'm, and, and you're not going to see this on live, but you're going to push off the inside of your foot. That is going to put pressure on that toe, and that's where your bunion is coming from. So you must fix that sphenoid before you work on somebody's bunion. Crazy, huh? Is that another challenge? Yes. <laughs> Diana's up for challenges. <laughs> this is an awesome uh, picture here. This is the manubrium and the, and the uh, so like the manubriums are thoracic keystone. So you can see there's a fissure right here or a symphysis which separates these two bones, anatomists. This is your sternum, this is your manubrium. Now here's the cool part of this picture. This is from an actual human skeleton. I did not do it. No one got it. All right. <laughs> it's early, I guess. Look how huge this maneuverium is. I want to talk to the anatomist, so just give me a second here, Chauncey, because in our anatomy books, this looks like about the size of a quarter. Right, or we see those plastic skeletons. This looks very small. Look how huge that is. It's also about, I don't know. I haven't measured one specifically, but I can feel on my own, it's over half an inch thick. So it's a little breastplate, right? It's a little armor. So this is our keystone. What attaches to this keystone? The collarbone attaches to that sternum. What else? The sternum itself, correct, is attaching to that manubrium. What else? Which ribs, Whitney? The first and second. Right? So we got the first rib right here, and the second rib is really actually at that symphysis. But a part of it is on the uh, manubrium, and part of it is on the sternum. So we have clavicle first and second ribs. So remember, I said I like to be an efficient therapist, right? Mm -hmm. So we have manubrium first, second, and clavicle. What muscles attach to that for you anatomists? And what are they called? If you want to call them a group, you can call it a group. The subclavius muscle? Yeah, subclavian. That attaches right in here. Yeah. Scalenes attach in here. Your sternocloidal mastoid. The thoracic, the thoracic outlet is right in here. Absolutely. Right? Uh, so we have sternocloidal mastoid in there. Peck major. Peck major. Right? Peck major. Yep, peck minor. All secondary breathing muscles. See that client comes in, they breathe with their chest. Mm -hmm. Is that very efficient? No. It's not very efficient. But that's what people do. So what I decided to do, because I used to do this. Oh, I'm going to work, I'm going to dig my finger on those scalings. I'm going to have a lot of fun, because that's a lot of fun when you've had that done to you, right, people? 
work on that sternocleidal mastoid. You work on all these neck muscles, it's gonna take you like an hour. Client feels great. They're like, oh man, thank you so much. I feel so much better. And two days later, you call up to see how are they doing. Exactly the same as when I came to see you. Like shit. Because you haven't done nothing. Structure dictates function. You have to get this structure in harmony with each other. And then the body will just flow. Right? So instead of wasting hours trying to get all these muscles to release, just take care of this guy. Oh, you're done. Quick and easy. Um, I don't know if we had one in your class in LA, but uh, I had a few where just make a correction to the manubrium in the sternal or a manubrium in the clavicle, and all of a sudden your belly just blows up into this huge, beautiful belly breath. Did I teach them how to breathe? Nope. All I did was get the body to equalize its pressure so it could breathe on its own normally. You cannot teach breathing. How many trainers do you know out there? Oh, you got to spend 15 minutes on this pocket hall breathing. Well, you just wasted 15 minutes of my time where I could have been working out. It's a waste of time. So you can get the body to restore itself and it will restore itself to perfect function. Because no one taught you how to breathe. Though it brings you up a good point. If someone brings their young child to you and they're having breathing problems, obviously they can't drive to their client on their own if they're young, and so a parent comes with them. Guess who you're going to end up working on? The parent. Because the child is going to mimic the parent's breath. Okay? So it's always fun when the parents come for the session and they think it's for the kid. <laughs> you end up working on them. So, this is the posterior aspect of the sphenoid. So this is if uh, you're looking through the back of somebody's head. And this is the top of the sacrum, okay? So what I did is I created this little video. Let's see if this one works. Say that again. Well, since my video didn't work, what it is here is I flip the sphenoid upside down and I put it right on top of the sacrum. And wouldn't you as you know said they look exactly alike? Yeah. Yeah, they do, don't they? That's the yin and the yang in the body. You guys hear heard of the yin and the yang, right? So which one's the yin and which one's the yang? Both. Why do I say both? Because if you see the yin and yang picture, there's a little of both in each. Right, the white has a black dot in it and the black has a white dot in it. But if you want to go back to the video I showed you with the heart valve, the sphenobasilar joint, these are two bones, I would call that the master. And then the pelvic floor, which is just the coccyx and the muscles, that would be the soft part. So if you have a soft valve and a hard valve, you, for all you plumbers out there, <laughs> which one's going to go bad first? The soft valve is going to go bad first, and so now you have a pelvic floor problem. Mm -hmm. But it's not the pelvic floor that's the problem. Okay? But that's going to, what's going to show up as the symptom first. You okay with that, Whitney? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You get just light bulbs going off all over the place. <laughs> Did you say this was the hard the sphenoid is the hard valve because there's two bones making up that joint. And the pelvic floor muscles make up the soft valve. So with the sacrum, you can see it's a huge wedge. Right? So that's really how you can see the keystone is a wedge. It's right there in your body. What we're going to look at for this class is the SI joint because that's going to include the ilium and the sacral. Some people will get confused, like, well, you're not, you're not comparing the sacral to the ilium. Yes, I am. We're just calling it the SI joint to keep it simple for level one. Okay. The talus, it's in your ankle. What's significant about the keystone of the talus? 
tendinous attachments. No tendinous or muscular attachments, right? Tendinous is more accurate than muscular yeah. attachments. Thank you, John. Um, so if this is one of the keystones of the body and there are no tendinous attachments, which means no muscular attachments, that sparked my head, my brain going, well, if there are no attachments, no tendinous, now John, you're making me say it all the time now, and muscular attachments <laughs> to this talus, then why the hell are we working on muscles? As an economist, that, doesn't that make sense? Right? Efficiency. Efficiency. Right. So that shows you how low muscles are on the totem pole. Okay? And the big toe. Why is the big toe important? What does it do for us? Stability. Balance, stability, and? Also, move us forward, which I just gave you like a multi-dimensional answer that you won't understand until later. Okay. <laughs> so in this class, I'm going to teach you like 80% of what you need to know about gait. Over the weekend in 1.5, I'm going to teach you the other 18 or 19%. What's the other two, one or two? It's higher than that. <laughs> it's higher than the level one stuff. Yeah. It's, it's more than that percent, but you guys are stuck on, you know, the physical have, stuff. I have a question. Yes, Dinah. You're talking about toes and moving forward. Yes. So is that, are you saying something like maybe people like this out? In life, yes. Yeah. It means you're stuck in the past. They can't move forward. Do young people have bunions or only old Do they? People? I don't know. They do if their mom does, because they start moving just like their mother or their father. Yeah. DNA memory. Part of that, yes. Part of it's birth. So what's cool, really cool with voilas, we have a few voila babies out there, we call them, and they've been in balance as soon as they came out of the womb. In balance? Balance. Well, they come out of the womb imbalanced yeah. because the pressure system isn't changed. They've gone through the canal, so their head gets a little distorted, so you just make the little corrections. They correct so quickly. Or if they get a C-section, what the doctor does is they, they cut that open really quick, pressure drops, the baby gets the bends, and now they get sucked out of the mom's belly. Right? They get yanked out of there. So you're saying that's born by a cesarean section, you know? Yes, you do. You have a really tough start in life because the birthing process and the birthing canal starts the pressure system. You get squished and then you breathe. That activates it. It also activates what we talk about in level four. If you're born C section, most of those won't get activated. I'm not going to give you the answer yet. Right. So, yes, being born C section, you have a tough start in life. Right. Doesn't mean you're stuck there, though. We can, we can help you. Mm -hmm. How you guys doing? Ready to keep going? So when I say the sphenobasal joint or the SBJ, this is what I'm talking about. That's where the sphenoid and the occiput come together. You have to remember that. That's the biggest thing you have to remember today. It's actually called a uh, sphenobasal Synchrosis. 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 Thank you. You've been practicing. <laughs> he, know, he knows I can't say it. <laughs> I call him out on that. In LA. <laughs> but I just call it the SBJ for short. Some people call it the SJB. Doesn't really matter. Just to show you how important this joint is. If we, <clears throat> if we do a cut down the center of my body, left and right side, Cut straight down the center, and then you go front and back, straight down the center. So this spot in the top of my head, and we drop a plumb line straight down through the floor. What other joint is along that line? Correct. 
you're at zero. Unless you want to count the parietal and occiput where they come together, the bui na in Chinese medicine, or the tip of the coccyx on exhale. Remember I showed that in the video. Mm -hmm. It's the only two that are along that spot. Now do you see the importance of this joint? There's no other joint on that axis. It's the only one. Now do you see how powerful this is and why we can make corrections so quickly by balancing the spinal basal joint? Mm -hmm. Pretty crazy, this tiny little joint and there's no other matching up joints in the body. That just blew my mind when I figured that out. I was like, holy shit. I just like swear. So. <laughs> So the sphenol basilar joint, how many of your clients have come in with neck pain, back pain, scoliosis, and headaches? Memory issues. So everything you see on this list was me. I had a head injury at eight years old, took a wagon off of a cliff, don't recommend it. Right? Didn't go well. Didn't land quite the way I wanted. <laughs> had my other big one uh, playing football. Had a couple of various motorcycle and car accidents since then. So I had the sinus issues, allergies, had all that, reading problems. I remember getting pulled into a closet at school, and I believe, I believe I was in fourth or sixth grade. I can't remember exactly which. And they brought me into this room and said, hey, Joel, can you read for us? I'm like, yeah, sure. So I picked up the book, and I took my finger, and I went across the page with my finger and I read to them. And they're like, wonderful. Can you take your finger away and read for us? Couldn't do it. So I had head injuries when I was younger. So I had to use my finger so I could follow along so the words wouldn't jumble and move around. So I don't like to read that well. I can but I'm very slow. And it's not because I can't read or I'm not smart enough, it's that the words start to move. So I have to use my finger to keep everything in line. That's what I used to have to do. You see, uh, there's actually a thing out there where they're writing, there's like a little ruler and you move it down so you only see that one line at a time. Right? That's for us people with head injuries. Pretty crazy. We had a guy in class who couldn't, was struggling, we'll say, was struggling reading his four-year-old book at bedtime. So a four-year-old book, he was having trouble with words. Head injuries. Now he can read to his daughter. He's super stoked. Right? Um, insomnia, anxiety, we've had people with severe anxiety come and take the class where their husband or spouse had to bring them to the seminar because they could not drive. And at the end of the seminar, they asked if they could drive home. So this helps with anxiety. So that's the fun part. And all those neuromuscular dysfunctions that you guys think you're finding. So we have a, uh, we have this couple Wife took my class, he took a different class. And in that class, they have a 90 minute assessment. So he runs through the 90 uh, minute assessment, and finds all these problems. She falls asleep in the corner. She's like, Are you guys done yet? And she's like, Almost. She finishes up. She does the voila assessment, makes the corrections all in under 15 minutes. He went back to do his 90 minute assessment again just to see what changes were. And there were only one or two things that weren't corrected. And that was all just doing level one. If they were done the higher level two stuff, it would take care of all of it. So do you want to do a 90 minute assessment and get no treatment, but just a 90 minute assessment? Or do you want to do an assessment and a treatment when, when someone comes to see you? 
in LA, we have natural pass. It's 15 minutes, $400. It's an assessment, no treatment. You don't get a treatment until the second time you come in. Guess how many times I've seen that naturopath? Zero. <laughs> Why? <laughs> right? So, while is going to affect the brain, it's going to affect the fascia, it's going to affect the joints, it's going to affect the muscles, it's going to affect the bones. It's going to affect the lymph, the periosteum, the organs, the skin, the mucus, the metabolism, the emotions, the chakras, the auras, the energy chi, the meridians, the metabolism. We've had people gain and lose weight. One of my buddies just lost 70, 60, 60 pounds. He's 56 years old, just after taking voila level two. He's lost 60 pounds. I worked on another guy via Skype. Saw him two weeks later, he put on eight pounds of muscle. That's insane, right? So it works with metabolism. Works with the hormones. Uh, this, is, this is one of my favorites. Everybody says the gut is causing all the problems in the brain. What a crack of shit that is. The brain is affecting the gut. It's on top for a reason. Right? Reflexes, primitive reflexes, and etc. But we're going to focus on bones and muscles in this class. So you don't think that certain foods affect your brain capacity? What certain foods affect is the emotion you've attached to that food. And that affects your brain capacity. So where did that start? Started here, <laughs> right? <laughs> that complete the, the loop. You can't believe how many people. Oh, I'm allergic to strawberries. Cool. You run an assessment. You figure out why they are allergic to, to strawberries, and it's because they've had some traumatic event as a kid. Or maybe they had a strawberry fight in the strawberry field, because me and my sisters used to do that all the time. <laughs> right? And say you got hit in the eye or something with a strawberry and you went crying to mom. Well, is it the strawberry or is it the action or the effect that it had on you? We've had people that are allergic to grass because their dad wouldn't let them cut the lawn. So they were upset with their dad, so now when they smell grass, they are upset with their dad. You clear that up, now they're no longer allergic to grass, which is the problem. I've got cases of this after over and over again. So when I see this, the gut is affecting the bullshit. Just bullshit. But yet, you'll see everybody posting it and reposting it. It's just jack shit. So, these are some of the things I look for when a person comes in. I look at their eyes. I'm looking at that orbital bone. I'm looking, is one eye higher or lower than the other? Is one eye in front or in back of the other? So I'm looking at that symmetry of their eyes. I'm looking at the symmetry of their ears. Are their ears level? These are all things you can look at real quick. Are their cheekbones level? High, low, front, back. Occipitals, it's hard to tell if that's even, especially if they have long hair. But I'm looking at those clavicles in that first rib. Are they level? I'm looking at those hips. Are those hips level? I'm looking at their feet. Are their ankles dropping in? Are they turned in? Are they turned out? We've had people in the last couple of classes that I taught, when they lay down, their feet are like this on the table. They're just splayed out like this. You don't want to balance somebody to that. You want to bring them back up into a somewhat neutral position. Each time we have done that, this actually happened in uh, your class. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a woman, the pinky toe laying directly on the table. She's like, this is normal. So we started balancing it to her feet like this. And the next day she came in and she's like, Joel, look. And I'm looking at him, I'm going, yeah, her feet are straight up toward, toward the ceiling. I go, what's the thing? She's like, you don't remember. Yesterday my feet would be like this was normal. I was like, oh my God, I totally forgot. 
right? It just, boom. So she pointed out to me, now her feet can face up. So that's how quickly you guys can make changes now. So here's a great uh, uh, picture of a friend of mine. Sometimes where I fall on the shit because I rarely use pillowcases or pillows. But I haven't had one that had horizontal lines on it. So I want you to tell me what you can see. Or lower, how do we know? Right, you don't know if it's higher or lower yet. This is the, the reason I point that out is because people are going to look at that and say, oh, that eye's higher, right? Right. So you're going to use your eyes as the assessment, and what I'm going to tell you is your eyes will lie to you. You don't know if that eye is high or low. or Because it looks high. You don't know if that eye is high. I'll point that out why in just a second. I'll give you that like logic. The other one is low. Right. Low. Right. Because once I open your eyes up a little bit more, you'll see it. Look at his cheeks. Mm -hmm. This one actually is possibly higher, but it's definitely in front. Or if this one's behind, we don't know yet. Look at his nostrils. Mm -hmm. Are they level? He's all twisted. Yeah, he's all twisted. Uh, it's hard to see in this picture, but you can see his clavicle here also is off. Now, if you're really good, you see the half moon. You see his jaw is facing this way, and his forehead is facing this way. This is what you see when someone gets stuck in the birth canal. He was stuck in the birth canal, I think, for nine hours. <laughs> Yeah. So now that I told you his head is like this, is this eye high or low? Low. Right? Because his head is squished here and it's wide open over here. So that's where the eyes can fool you if you're doing just a visual assessment. And you see that all the time. You'll see me. I've made mistakes. I'll be uh, up here doing a demonstration, and I'm running through, and I'm like, oh, that clavicle is definitely the problem. There's no doubt in my mind I will put a million dollars clavicle. But I still have to run my entire assessment, and in my head I'm still going, I know it's that clavicle. And I come down here and I go, four toes, are you the priority? And it goes, yes. Boom, come down here, make a correction to a toe, clavicle evens out. So the, the eyes will fool you. But we've been trained to use our eyes. Just know this, we have an entire class devoted just to eyes. Because what I see, what Chris sees, what Keith sees, what Chauncey sees, what Lidwin sees, is all going to be different. But if we do the voila assessment, then I'll know that matters. Okay. You good with that, Dinah? <laughs> right, because we've been trained to look with our eyes. We've been trained for that. So here, he happened to have a picture when he was uh, nine. Unfortunately, he uh, cut off his ears here. But you can see the same exact setup we got now what you can see more here is look how much pressure is behind this eye this eye is bugging out you know that because you can see the white under the eye and that's a key thing you want to really look for unfortunately he cut off this curl right why he did that i have no idea <laughs> i like to tease him but this is a guy that comes in your office he's a black belt in karate Traditional Japanese karate, so not a dancer. <laughs> All sorts of foot problems. All sorts of foot problems. But he started early in life. Probably because he wore flip flops. <laughs> what a joke. So here's a picture of a guy, don't worry about the tape. He's just trying to, uh, this is to help him breathe. That's what he's doing there with the tape. But the big thing I want you to look at here is the back of his head, the occiput. And what do you see? 
this chin is high, yeah, that, that's off, right? Let's just not even look at his face. Do you guys see his occiput is way over there? Lots of head injuries. So his occiput is back here. So what you need to know about the occiput, the occiput is the screen. The sphenoid is the projector. So if the screen is, and this, I can't move this screen because it's bolted to the wall, but if this screen is moved, can, are you seeing very well? No. This is the person that couldn't read to the child. Because right, it's, it's not being put on the projector well enough. So we're going to go on a quick break here. So you guys can uh, gather your thoughts, go to the bathroom. Where's the bathroom, John? Thank you for joining us all live.